In this lecture, we're going to look at the male reproductive organs. But we're also, because we're in this region, going to look at the bladder and the rectum. So we'll start off with by looking at the boundaries of the abdomino-pelvic cavity and looking at the bony pelvis. This is important as we progress now into the pelvic part of the course. We'll look at the bladder, its relations to other organs and its structure. And then we'll spend considerable time looking at the male reproductive organs. We'll look at the testes, we'll look at the ductus deferens. We'll then look at the seminal vesicles, the ejaculatory ducts and the prostate. And then we'll look most posteriorly within the pelvis and we'll look at the rectum, the relations of the rectum and also the structure of the rectum itself. But essentially, the main focus of this lecture is the male reproductive organs. And these are essential for sexual reproduction. They produce, store and expel the male gamete sperm during sexual intercourse. But let's have a look at the abdomino-pelvic cavity and specifically the pelvis. And that's what we're looking at here. Previously we saw the posterior abdominal wall filling this kind of space around here. But now we're concentrating purely on this region. This is the, the pelvis or the innominate bone, and we're really going to be concentrating on the structures that are found within this region. But remember that the abdominal contents extend into the pelvic cavity. So unlike the thorax and the abdomen, which is separated by that partition, the diaphragm, there's no clear separation. Remember, the abdominal viscera are bound by the peritoneum. That doesn't happen in the pelvis. The peritoneum drapes on top of the pelvic organs, and we'll explore that as we go on. Now, the pelvic cavity is this funnel-shaped space. It's bounded by bones, ligaments, and muscles. And it contains the urinary system, the ureters and the bladder, pelvic reproductive organs. In the male, we have the prostate, seminal vesicles. In the female, we have the uterus and the ovaries. And it also contains the distal parts of the gastrointestinal tract, the rectum. So if we look at the bony pelvis, then we can see there's various structures that we need to be familiar with. So if we look, we can see posteriorly here, we have the space where the fifth lumbar vertebra would sit and then we have the sacrum which we can see down here and then most inferiorly we have the coccyx and this marks the posterior boundary of the pelvis we can see that if we look at sagittal section we can see we have l5 vertebra here and then we have the sacrum which is radiating in this direction finishing up with the coccyx we can see most anteriorly we have the pubic symphysis here and then next to it we have the pubic crest which is running along here. Running from the pubic crest all the way around to the sacrum we have this pelvic brim and that's running all the way around and that's forming this nice pelvic brim. That separates as we'll see the greater from the lesser pelvis. We can see this also in this sagittal section where we have the pubic symphysis here and then we have the pelvic brim running along here. We can also see if we radiate away inferiorly from the pubic symphysis we can see what's known as the inferior pubic ramus here and that runs towards the ischium and you have the ischiopubic ramus along here. This part is called the superior pubic ramus. We can see that this creates a foramen, and that's obturator foramen. And previously we spoke about obturator foramen having obturator artery pass through. We'll soon see the obturator artery, nerve and vein passes through here. We can see posteriorly on the ischium we have these little notches. These are known as the greater and lesser sciatic notches and these notches are converted into foramina via a series of important ligaments. Here we have what's known as the ischial spine and here we have the ischial tuberosity. Connecting the ischial spine to the sacrum is the sacrospinous ligament which we can see here. Connecting the ischial tuberosity to the sacrum we have the sacrotuberous ligament which we can see up here. 
And these two ligaments convert these notches into foramina. So now we have the greater sciatic foramen and we have the lesser sciatic foramen. We'll come back to these when we look at the perineum, but they're really important structures. So superiorly, when we look down onto the pelvis, we can see what's known as the pelvic inlet. And that is bordered by the pelvic brim, the pubic symphysis, and the sacral promontory, which we can see here. We can demarcate that in this sagittal one by this line here, and that's the pelvic inlet. We also have the pelvic outlet, and that's bordered by the pelvic diaphragm and the pubic symphysis and the coccyx. And that is going to be running down in this region here, and that is the pelvic outlet. So we have structures entering the pelvis through the pelvic inlet, and things can pass out of the pelvis via the pelvic outlet, and we can see that here. The pelvic inlet is separating the pelvis into greater and lesser pelvis. Above the pelvic inlet, we have the greater pelvis, which is going to be this region up here, and that contains the ilium and it contains the sigmoid colon. Below this pelvic brim, we have the lesser pelvis, and that's in this region here, which contains the bladder, reproductive organs, and also the rectum. The inferior limit of the pelvic, of the lesser pelvis, of the inferior limit of the lesser pelvis, is the pelvic diaphragm. And this is a sheet of muscle. The pelvic diaphragm is very similar to the diaphragm in that it separates the lesser pelvis from a region called the perineum, which we'll explore in a later class. So they've got the lesser pelvis and they've got the pelvic diaphragm and then you've got the perineum underneath. So this muscular separation, much like the diaphragm, this muscular diaphragm separates the thorax from the abdomen. So that's the bony pelvis, and we refer to these structures throughout this lecture and lectures to come. Now let's turn to the bladder, and on the screen we can see two hemisections of the pelvis, which has been cut down in the sagittal plane, and here we can see we have the male pelvis, and here we can see we have the female pelvis. And what we can see is anteriorly over here, and posteriorly here for the male, anterior here, and posterior here for the female we can see that directly behind the pubic symphysis in both the male and the female, we have the bladder, which we can make out here. So both in the male and the female, we have the bladder directly posterior to the pubic symphysis. Now, the bladder is a hollow organ. It's a hollow organ that has strong muscular walls, and these walls are distensible. That means that the bladder can alter in shape in size, much like the stomach did. The position is found within the lesser pelvis, so it's found beneath the pelvic brim, and it's posterior to the pubic symphysis. It is inferior to the peritoneum. So we have a layer of peritoneum coming down from the anterior abdominal wall in both the male and the female, and then the peritoneum lies over the top of the bladder. We can see it here. See the peritoneum lying over the top of the bladder. Now, the overlying peritoneum can form pouches as it covers the pelvic viscera that project up into the pelvic cavity, that project into the pelvic cavity. So in the male, we can have a pouch where we've got the bladder, and then here we've got the rectum. So here in the male, we can see directly posterior to the bladder, we find the rectum. And we can follow the peritoneum as it comes from the anterior abdominal wall over the bladder and then up the rectum up here, and then follows the various contours of the gastrointestinal tract. We can see that the bladder is inferior to the peritoneum. But this space that's located in between the bladder and the rectum, which is lined by peritoneum, this in the male is known as the recto -resicle pouch. The recto -resicle pouch. It's in between the rectum and the bladder. In the female, a similar arrangement occurs, but you have the vagina and the uterus positioned between the bladder and 
and the rectum. But we can still follow this peritoneum. So the peritoneum goes over the bladder and then it can actually go over the uterus, which we see here, positioned on top of the bladder. So the peritoneum comes over the superior surface of the bladder. It may creep in between the bladder and the uterus. And then it runs over the uterus here to then form this pouch in between the uterus and the rectum. Here we can see the rectum in the female. So because the uterus is in between the bladder and the rectum, in the female, we have two pouches. We have the pouch that's in between the bladder and the uterus, the so-called risico-uterine pouch, and that's what we can see here. And then between the uterus and the rectum, we find we have the recto-uterine pouch. And this recto-uterine pouch is really important in the female. In the female, this pouch can collect free fluid or pus. Free fluid or pus that's accumulated in the peritoneal cavity can migrate to this deep pouch via the various paracolic gutters. And this pus needs to be drained. And the easiest way to access this pouch is to pass through the vagina. So transvaginal approach will allow access to this pouch and the pus and free fluid can be drained away. That prevents any interference with the rectum, introducing feces into the peritoneal cavity and passing through this way would prevent the abdominal cavity being opened up to the outside environment. So transvaginally can then enter through this small fibromuscular wall and enter into the recto-uterine pouch to withdraw free fluid or pus. Let's continue with the bladder and the urethra. So the bladder is going to receive urine via the two ureters. Urine has been produced by the kidneys, the ureters have descended along the posterior abdominal wall and then they're going to enter into the bladder. Now this view is of a male bladder and actually we're looking at it as if someone is standing behind me. Someone's standing behind me and looking through my pelvis into the posterior aspect of the bladder and the posterior aspect of the bladder has been opened up. So what we can see here is the apex of the bladder that's attaching to the anterior abdominal wall. So the apex is attaching to the anterior abdominal wall just above the pubic symphysis. We can see these nice muscular detrusor muscle fibers forming the wall. We can see the internal surface of the bladder is elevated into these rugae, allowing the bladder to be distensible. We can also see that we have this smooth region of the bladder, and this is known as the trigone. This is a kind of triangular shaped area that is flat. It doesn't contain these rugae and the detrusor muscle, it doesn't really contract. And that's a good thing, as when the bladder wants to eject the urine, the body of the bladder can contract, forcing urine out. If the trigone contracted, then the, the, the urine within the bladder would just be compressed, it wouldn't be ejected. At the apex, these two apices of the trigone here and here, we see an opening for the two ureters, we see the ureteric orifice and then this trigone tapers down into the urethra and here we can see the urethra. Now in the male the urethra passes through the prostate gland and we can see the prostate surrounding the urethra and this will be the prostatic part of the urethra. So we can see the bladder is storing the urine and then when it comes to being ejected with micturition so the urine passes through the urethra. We can see on this diagram here, the urine is going to pass through the urethra, which is at the level of the prostate, and then it's going to pass through the penis. So we can see with the notes now alongside the diaphragm, the diagram, that the bladder has an apex, it has a body, has a fundus, and then it tapers down into this neck here. So we can see the neck of the bladder here, and we can see the trigone, we can see the apex up here, we can see a nice 
body along the superior surface and then the fundus, this posterior aspect of the bladder. We can see we've got nice detrusor muscle, allowing the muscle to constrict tightly. It's got four surfaces, the bladder. It's got this superior surface, and then it's going to have two infralateral surfaces that converge, much like the front of a boat. The two infralateral surfaces that converge and form the apex. And then you've got the superior surface here. You will then find posteriorly near the fundus, this posterior surface. The bladder neck, as I said, tapers, and we find the internal urethral orifice, and urine passes through this internal urethral orifice, and it enters into the prostatic part of the urethra. The internal urethral orifice marks the beginning of the urethra, and like I said, this initially passes through the prostate, but it exits the pelvis by entering into the base of the penis. And here we can see we have various parts of our urethra passing through the penis. We can see we have this what's called intramural or this pre-prostatic part that's just the portion by the neck of the bladder before it's got into the prostate. We then have a prostatic ure urethra which is important as this is where semen from the seminal reticles and sperm from the um, testes can enter into the urethra for ejaculation. So here we have the prostatic urethra. We then have a portion of the urethra called the membranous part. And this is the bit that passes through that pelvic diaphragm as it's leaving the pelvis and entering the perineum. Because the actual penis itself is found within the perineum and the urethra running through the penis is known as the spongy urethra as it's running through a erectile tissue called corpus spongiosum. So four parts to the penis. Uh, intramural or a pre-prostatic part, a prostatic part that runs through the prostate, a membranous part that passes through the pelvic diaphragm, and a spongy part that runs through corpus spongiosum. So now let's turn our attention to the male reproductive organs. And really, let's start with the testes. Now, we looked at the testes in some detail when we looked at the inguinal canal and the formation of the inguinal canal and how the testes migrated through the anterior abdominal wall. And now we can see the testes in a bit more detail. We can see the testes here that's been opened up. The various layers that are covering it have been opened up. So if the layers are all intact, we'd have in this diagram here, we can see this membrane that's been removed, that is our external spermatic fascia. If you remember deep to the external spermatic fascia, we had the cremaster muscle and cremaster fascia. We can see that here, this muscular portion. And then if that was removed, we'd then find we have the internal spermatic fascia, which we can see here. So we've got the external, We've got the chromasta, and then we've got this internal spermatic fascia. And on this diagram, we can see the internal spermatic fascia just deep to this chromasta. So this, this layer that's running around here. These layers are important because if you remember, they were derived from the inguinal canal as it passed through. And the male gametes are produced in the testes. And they run through this spermatic cord via the ductus deferens, which is within these spermatic fascial coverings through the inguinal canal. So remember those various layers that form the spermatic cord. As the testes migrated to the scrotum, they were enclosed by a peritoneal sac. So a small little outpoaching of the peritoneum enclosed the testes as they migrated down. And this is known as the tunica vaginalis. And the tunica vaginalis, forming this peritoneal sac, has parietal and visceral layers. So the parietal layer, you'd imagine, lines the inside of the internal spermatic fascia. And that's what we can see here. If we look at the testy, we can see that here's the internal spermatic fascia, and lining the inside of it, we've got the parietal layer of tunica vaginalis the parietal layer of tunica vaginalis. 
If you then actually look at the surface of the testy, you'll see the surface of the testy is closely associated with this visceral layer. And this runs up alongside the epididymis and it runs alongside the ductus deferens. But again, between these visceral and parietal layers, this time of the tunica vaginalis, we find a thin film of fluid allowing the testes to move freely. So we can see we have the tunica vaginalis, this visceral layer, tightly adhered to the testes, and then a space for some thin layer of fluid, and then we have the parietal layer running around. The parietal layer. The parietal layer runs on the inside of the internal spermatic fascia, and then we have the cremaster muscle and fascia and the external that form the spermatic cord. If we were to section through the testes, we'd see we have a whole series of lobules and some septums separating these lobules, and these are producing the sperm, producing the male gamete. The actual testicle is covered by a tough membrane, and that's known as the tunica albigenia, which we can see here. This is deep. This is deep to the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis, the tunica albigenia. The sperm are generated in these convoluted seminiferous tubules that are running throughout the testes, and that's what produces these um, sperm. They converge to form the retitestes that then passes towards the epididymis. And here we can see the epididymis, this large tube that is receiving all of the produced gametes, producing the, um, the collection of sperm that are then going to pass the ductus deferens. So these, the retitesti, converge in the epididymis, and then the epididymis descends down from its head, it descends down as the body towards the tail of the epididymis. Notice how you've got the testi, and then over the superior pole of the testi, you find the head of the epididymis, and then the body extends to the inferior pole of the testi, where you find the tail. The tail of the epididymis is then continuous with the ras deferens, and it's the ras deferens that runs within the spermatic cord to enter the pelvis via the inguinal canal. So, we've now got the sperm running through the ductus deferens. They run through the ductus deferens, they enter the inguinal canal via the superficial inguinal ring, they then run along the inguinal canal to enter the pelvis via the deep inguinal ring. And we can pick them up running alongside the bladder. So here, the posterior view of the bladder, we've got the posterior view of the bladder, we can just see the apex at the top going to the anterior abdominal wall. And running down, we've got the ureters, coming from the two kidneys, we've got the ureters running down. And sweeping around the bladder, we can find we've got our ductus deferens. Notice how they run over the bladder, or the bladder runs under the ductus deferens, we can see them here. Obviously, we have two. We have two testes, one on either side in the scrotum. So we have two ductus deferens. As they run along the posterior surface of the bladder, they become dilated. And that's what we call the ampulla of the ductus deferens. And here, the ampulla of the ductus deferens runs alongside an important gland. And this gland is known as the seminal vesicle or the seminal gland. The seminal glands produces the seminal fluid, produces the environment that is helpful, that is friendly for the sperm to survive in, prior to ejaculation, and then delivering them in the vaginal vault, hopefully passing through the cervix for reproduction to occur. So we have the seminal glands here. If we look at this diagram on the opposite side, we can see that we have the prostatic part of the urethra, indicated here in yellow. So that's the prostatic part of the urethra, and that's going to carry on extending all the way down towards the membranous part of the urethra here. And what we can see is that we've got our prostate, the urethra passing through the prostate, and we can see this seminal vesicle, and we can see our ras deferens. And the opening for the seminal vesicle combines 
with the ras deferens to form an ejaculatory duct. This ejaculatory duct courses through the substance of the prostate to open up into the prostatic urethra. So here we've got the prostatic urethra and we can see that the ejaculatory duct is opening up into it. This is how the semen can then be expelled from the body by passing into urethra that runs through the penis. So we've got the ureters entering into the bladder which we can see here. The important point is the relationship the ureters have to the ductus deferens and the ureters run underneath the ductus deferens or the ras deferens. The ductus deferens occur at the start of the epididymis, so where you have the tail of the ep epididymis, then the ductus deferens continue. The ductus deferens, they enter the pelvis by crossing the iliac vessels and they run over the ure ureters. As they approach the seminal vesicles, they dilate and form the ampulla. The ampulla then combines with the seminal vesicles to form the ejaculatory duct. The seminal vesicles are important in secreting this thick alkaline fluid. This is important because the environment of the regina is quite acidic and the alkaline helps to neutralize that environment. The ejaculatory ducts are then the slender tubes that pass through the substance of the prostate and they open on the seminal colliculus. This is an elevation of the prostatic urethra. You can see that the prostate, this accessory gland of reproduction, is surrounding the urethra. It produces this thin, milky fluid, which constitutes about 20% of the semen. And the prostate, as I've mentioned, contains the prostatic urethra. The posterior wall, which is this portion here that we're looking at, the posterior wall of the prostatic urethra is characterized by the urethral crest. That is this elevation, which we can see here. We can see we have prostatic sinus or grooves, which are either side of the crest, so the prostatic sinus and the grooves down here. And then we have this prominent seminal colliculus, this prominent elevation which we can see around in this region here. The, the ejaculatory ducts open on the seminal colliculus. So that's where the ejaculatory ducts open into the prostatic urethra. The prostatic ducts, they open either side of the um, urethral crest, either side of the seminal colliculus in the prostatic grooves or the sinuses. You may find that you see this prostatic utricle, just this little opening here, and that's an embryological remnant, and that is the equivalent of the um, regina, but obviously that's um, defunct in the, in the male. So that's really all I want to say about the male reproductive organs. And just to finish the lecture, I just want to move on to the rectum. We can see the rectum here, the distal portion of the gastrointestinal tract that's in the male running posterior to the bladder. Here we've got the anterior aspect, we've got the pubic symphysis, we've got the bladder, and here we can see the rectum here is posteriorly. The rectum is going to pass through the pelvic diaphragm. It's continuous with the sigmoid colon and it joins the anal canal. The rectum begins at the recto-sigmoid junction and this occurs anterior to the third sacral vertebra. At this point, the tina coli that have existed around the sigmoid colon combine to form a continuous longitudinal layer. And there's no amental appendices. We don't find those like we found them in the other parts of the colon. The rectum is located posterior to the seminal vesicles, the ductus deferens, and the bladder. But there's some important peritoneal relations of the rectum. And we can divide the rectum into three. If we look here, we can see that we have the superior third, we have the middle third, and we have this inferior third of the rectum. We can see the superior third has peritoneum on both its anterior and its lateral sides. So the peritoneum is on the anterior and lateral surface. The middle third, this one here, we can just see we have 
peritoneum on its anterior surface. And then the inferior third, we have no covering of peritoneal, peritoneum, and it's actually what's known as subperitoneal, and that's this region down here. So we can see how the rectum has different peritoneal coverings along its course. Here we've opened up the rectum, we can see we'd have the sigmoid colon up here, and we can now see we have this continuous longitudinal muscle layer. We don't have those tina coli. And we can see that it extends all the way to the skin where we have the anal opening. And here we can find where we've got the anus, the so-called anorectal junction. And I'll come to the anorectal junction in more detail when we look at the perineum in a later lecture. But I just want to concentrate on the rectum really itself, that part above the anorectal junction. There are internal folds, internal transverse folds are present. These superior, intermediate and inferior rectal folds. We can see them passing in to the lumen of the rectum here and these are important as they form these shelf-like structures that support the faeces passing through the rectum. They help to prevent the faeces from just sliding away. We also have a dilated portion of the rectum, the rectal ampulla, and that's important because it can dilate. It's positioned above the pelvic diaphragm, so the rectal ampulla in this region here is above the pelvic diaphragm, and it's a place where the faeces can be stored prior to defecation. It's able to relax and distend, so to accommodate the um, presence of the faeces. I'll come back to the rectum and the anal canal in more detail when we look at the pelvic, um, look at the perineum. But that's all I want to mention, the main focus being on the male reproductive organs in this lecture. But we've introduced the abdominopelvic cavity, looked at the pelvic inlet and outlet, and the greater and lesser pelvis. Again, we'll look at these in more detail as we go through this section. We looked at the bladder, both its relations in the male and female, and its relationship and the formation of peritoneal pouches. We looked at some features and the core of the bladder and the course of the urethra. We then spent some time on the male reproductive organs, looking at the passageway of the gamete from the testi to the penis and its various associated glands, the seminal vesicles and the prostate. And then we finished up by looking at the rectum.